The first time I saw it, I got goosebumps. It was perfect for me. I felt like we could go anywhere together. <sighs> There's nothing like finding your match on Cars.com. With over 50,000 cars added daily and a powerful advanced search, you're sure to discover the one. It's magical. Find your perfect match on Cars.com today. Welcome to CityCast Denver. I'm Bree Davies, and you're listening to Mayoral Madness, our effort to get to know all 17 candidates who want to be Denver's next mayor. Today, I'm speaking with Robert Treda. Robert, welcome to the show. Thank you. So you've been campaigning all over the city. I'd love to hear about a place that's new to you or a place that you've recently encountered that you love. Oh, boy. Um, some of the buildings that the Colorado Coalition for the Homeless have purchased uh, around town. I've been surprised in uh, about some of those buildings and you know how they're housing the homeless. What's surprising to you about them? Uh, how much money is being spent. Mm. Yeah. Do you feel like it's too much? Oh, yeah. Completely. Yeah, way too much. Uh, tens of millions of dollars and then uh, tens of millions of dollars for the build out to house maybe 94 homeless people. And I know that you're a builder, so I feel like What's coming through here is you've got a you've got a different idea of how this could work. Yeah, I believe I can take care of those problems for five and ten percent of what's currently being spent, and uh, using all that extra money for these services we're talking about. Some of them call them wraparound services. I don't like to use that word because it's more like a buzzword, and I don't like buzzwords. But yeah, services in general. Can I ask how you would do that at five to ten percent of the cost? I would build uh, something cost effective, not to get too technical about my my plan, but I have an actual blueprint. Uh, these are 16 by 16 private bathroom, private kitchen cubicles, attached cubicles built in tandem in groups of 24 um, on a mo monolithic slab with uh, SIP panel construction. It's like a prefab. It's not a manufactured home. It's kind of like a hybrid system. Um, but I can do those for $25,000 each. Interesting. Okay. We'll get back to that in a minute. But I'd love to ask sort of a broader question. Robert, why do you want to be mayor? <laughs> you know, I don't know if I totally want to be mayor, to be honest with you. Oh. Um, I don't know what's going to get in my way. Um, and I... Really, it started, um, it's, it's been going on for quite a while. I, I've just been disappointed over the years, waiting over a year for a simple building permit, seeing how it's affecting affordable housing, trying to get appointments with Mayor Hancock, and no return phone calls over the last 15 years. And then um, really what did it for me was George Floyd and being on the Capitol steps giving a speech April or uh, June 1st, 2020, and looking across the street and just being, you know, dumbstruck by the whole homeless uh, camp across the street in the park. Can you tell me more about what you saw or what you felt when you saw that? We're better than this. And where is our sense of humanity around this? And um, why are we letting this just continue and spiral out of control? And uh, we need to stop talking about this and start building immediately. You know, I ask people, you know, what do you need? And they tell me I need four walls and a roof. You know, I need I need a place to start over. And uh, that's what I want to do. And that that's what needs to be done. Can I ask you what you think about the current uh, camping ban and, and the sweeps that the, the city is doing? Yeah, I I hate the word sweeps because, you know, it's like just not the right word, but I, the media uses it a lot, so I have to acknowledge that. Being on the streets is no place for anybody to live or try to start over. Uh, we need to give everybody that wants one a starting point, and we need to, you know, drum up our sense of humanity uh, there's plenty of money to do this, which is the most surprising part. I mean, what, what's great about um, the city wasting money is that there's plenty of money to actually do what I want to do. So um, we need to, you know, I'm part of the, I'm from the school of housing first. You can't give somebody, you know, 
drug addiction therapy and send them back to their tent. It doesn't work that way. Um, I know a lot of people are criticizing Housing First as not working, but they're just simply not doing it right. It has to be all private. Uh, that is the key. No, nobody feels safe going into a shelter and a shared bath and so on and so forth. So if it's done right, it, it works really well, you know, so that's what I want to do. And um, this is the key, uh, key thing for me right now. What would you do your first day in office? Uh, first day in office, a, I would make a environmental policy cost zero dollars. And a lot of people don't know, but I'm a, <laughs> I'm a quite the environmentalist. And it gets kind of forgotten about because I talk about housing so much. But what I would do is ban, pl I know it sounds silly and people don't understand it, but I would ban plumbing penetrations from coming through the south side of every roof that you see out there. And why would you do that? For someone like me who doesn't have any concept of what that Because it's entails. the number one killer of a solar field, of a potential solar field or an immediate solar field. Uh, plumbing penetrations and what I call, what the call, we call in the trade turtle venting. It's how do you vent the roof? It's these big, you know, uh, kind of square vents that you see on every roof in Denver. Um, we would go to a ridge venting conju in conjunction with a soffit venting. Um, and that would free up all that uh, real estate basically on every roof to um, install solar panels. Uh, we're at a uh, critical moment here. Um, our electrical infrastructure is not ready um, with all these EVs coming online. Uh, I drive an EV. I've driven an EV for four years powered 100% by solar. So I understand what needs to be done. I lead by example. I'm the lead by example candidate. So the first day I would make that change in the building code and it would be the biggest change and greatest change for the environment that's ever happened and cost zero dollars. You, you mentioned you have an electric vehicle. You're an EV guy. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, like, what would be your strategy for a mass adoption of that? I know oh. Governor Polis clearly favors rebates, um, but they've just announced a whole bunch of different rebates recently. Um, but California is pursuing a different strategy, mandating all vehicles sold after 2035 to be electric. What would you think would be the better route as someone that's been driving one for a long time? First, before we talk about EVs, I want to acknowledge something. Lithium is a, simply a stepping stone for EVs. Uh, if you look at, uh, there's a car manufacturer called BYD. This is, I want to mention this because people might tune out and go, oh, EVs are bad for the environment. Well, there's a lot happening with battery technology. BYD is the biggest car manufacturer in China, EVs. They're going to be putting a sodium ion battery online. So it's going to take care of that whole lithium mining thing that's going on right now. So I just wanted to get that out of the way before we continue talking. The car manufacturers, it's not up to me to go EV. You have all these car manufacturers. I think Audi just announced like three weeks ago that they're going all EV also. The car manufacturers are telling us where they're going. So it has, it doesn't matter what I think, but all I know is that we're going there and Denver just simply is not ready. We don't have chargers out by the curb. We don't have, uh, I want to implement, you know, there's a quarter percent sales tax that we voted on a couple of years ago. That amounts to about $42 million for clean air, you know, initiatives. I want to use that money in a construction process, you know, project right now. I want to get chargers out to the curb for people because when I, you know, I've been driving EVs for years and I hear people going, well, I've got nowhere to charge it. Otherwise, I'd get one because nobody uses their garage in Denver. That's one thing we need to realize that, you know, so they need chargers out by the curb. Uh, Denver just allowed it like last year. And it's like EVs have been around for a long time. So we're just moving way too slow. We need to, there's a lot that can be done here. So I, I know that <clears throat> some of that fee you're talking about is funding our e-bike rebates, which are doing great. Would you take that money and push it towards construction and EV infrastructure? Or would you just like to expand EV use across different modes? I would absolutely subsidize directional boring technologies. So nobody wants to tear up their front yard, right? Okay. So they want an EV, but they want a charger out by the curb. 
So, I mean, XL Energy has been doing this for years. They directionally bore, they basically dig a, a trench out by the curb and they dig a trench out by your electrical panel. Denver is unique because 90% of electrical panels are situated outside the house. So you don't even have to wire through the house. So it's a very easy process. So you dig a hole out by the curb, you dig a hole below the electrical panel and you directionally bore an underground feeder. Um, it's really that easy, but there's no, I talk about directional boring and people look at me like I have two heads, you know, they just don't understand, but this is what Denver needs. And we need to subsidize this to encourage people to get EVs and solar panels on the roof. Like I drive a Tesla Model Y, 63,000 miles. A, that's how much power I generate on the last house I built. So people need to know this stuff. So I'm thinking about um, other transit modes and, and advocates that say, we need to get people out of their cars. How, what do you think about that? Would you, what would you be your approach to mass transit or, or alternative options to cars, whether they're EV or not? Absolutely. We need to be doing both. Um, you know, the big argument right now is we widen Pena Boulevard or we keep it two lanes. It's like we keep it two lanes and we make the A-line free. Uh, the A-line's way too expensive. You ask anybody for the last 10 years, like, why don't you take the train? They say, that's too expensive. And I don't want to take it. But if it was cheaper or free, I would for sure take it. So it's like, this is a common sense thing. So make the A-line free. You don't have to widen Pena. It probably is going to save us a ton of money. And yeah, it's so much better for the environment. I mean, everyone should be trying to take that train out to the airport. So uh, both things need to happen here. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that needs to happen. So I'm uh, advocating for both. But like, you know, sometimes I drive in from like Lyman, Colorado. I'm doing a construction project out there. I can't take mass transit. I have to take a car, sure. you know. So uh, but I, I take my EV, you know. Okay. So um, I'm also thinking about another issue Denverites are really concerned about right now related to cars, which is car theft. By some measures, we're the car theft capital of the country. What would you do as mayor to stop car thefts? Every you know, photo radar van will be a license plate recognition van. Okay. So any car that is stolen will be reported. We need to hire a task force to stem this off. Probably. I mean, I don't know exactly how it would go down, but we need to fund this. Um, we need to catch the real criminals, not the, you know, mom driving home from work and she's going five miles an hour over the speed limit and she gets a ticket. No, that can't happen anymore. We need to go after this car theft thing. Uh, you know, there's no follow up. They don't. I had a car stolen in 1996 uh, downtown. I went to go pick it up in Adams County. It was dusted for fingerprints. I kid you not. It was like, wow, they took it seriously. We don't take it seriously anymore. Uh, my girlfriend's car was stolen a few weeks ago. They just, they don't do anything. They just, you know, call your insurance company. That shouldn't be. I mean, we need to investigate these things. We need to, you know, uh, enforce the law. When you don't enforce the law, I mean, yeah, it's no surprise that car theft has gone up so much. Well, speaking of that, um, <clears throat> there's a bill in the state Senate recently approved that would make all auto thefts felonies, even thefts of vehicles that were worth less than two grand. Would you support that? I bill? completely agree with that. You do? Yes, I do. Interesting. So I'm also thinking about you had mentioned that you were at the George Floyd protests. Can I ask what your vision is for the Denver Police Department? The Denver Police Department you know, an article just came out about Aurora. I think they inter or they had uh, one thousand something applicants and only hired seventeen people. Uh, normally, they hire, I think it's ten percent, but this time around, uh, Aurora Police only hired one point six percent or something. That's alarming. And why is that happening? Why is that going on? Why is such a drastic decrease in people being accepted? So I don't know what's going on, but, I, you know, something's going on. There's something bigger at stake. Um, but you, know, you think we should increase the police force is what oh, you're saying? I do. Okay. I do, absolutely. But, like, not just increase the police force. Uh, we need to increase hugely our internal affairs department. We need body cam footage uh, observed, like, routinely at random. Uh, especially when, I mean, you look at what happened in Memphis, it's like, 
you know, there were reports about that scorpion unit or whatever, and no one was listening. You know, this could have been completely avoided, but, um, you know, no one was calling anybody back, you know, so we need the community to be involved too in bettering our police officers. I think police officers should live in the communities that they serve, but it's simply unaffordable for a lot of people to live in the district that they serve. Because when you have a sense of ownership in your neighborhood, well, you, wow, you're going to make it succeed. You know, there's an, more, more to stake than just patrolling and collecting a paycheck, you know. So um, I want to ask you a question from your own experience. You're, you own a contracting company and um, you've talked a lot about how you build and what you build. And I, so there's uh, this conversation in Denver about development and design in the last 10 to 15 years. There have been a lot of what I think I would call ugly and many people call fugly apartment buildings all over the city. They're flat, tall, frequently big, bold, chunky things, sometimes with small windows. I don't know. There's just there's a lot of criticism around what new development looks like. It's kind of this push and pull. We need it, but could we make it less ugly? What would you do about that as mayor with someone who has this experience in construction? Yeah, well, there a lot of flat top roofs go in. You know, I, I'm from the Highlands area and it's like a lot of construction is going on with like I think it's where the development's coming from. Like a flat roof is horrible in Denver. I mean, you get ice dams, you get leaks. It's it's terrible. I had a friend buy one, a duplex, half of a duplex, and I went to inspect it. It was brand new. And he, he goes, what do you think? I go, I give it a year before the roof leaks. And it did, you know? So it's like, where does, if you look at any house like built around 1900, it has a 12-12 pitch, like a severe pitch. I mean, that's done for a reason. You know, because we get a lot of snow and we get a lot of ice dams. But, I, you know, I don't think we should be in any position that, you know, we shouldn't make Denver into one big HOA. I mean, the best thing to get away from the flat roofs is people stop buying them, you know. <laughs> I mean, you know, buy something more traditional looking. So it's it's a fad. And I, I hope I don't, I'm not a big fan of those. You know, but I, you're saying you wouldn't implement design guidelines or anything like that. You feel no, like that was where you I, yeah. I, what I'm taking from your Denver doesn't need to be, have a giant, yeah, be a giant I, HOA. I, I think it's a road we shouldn't go down. OK, um, but like I do honor historic districts. And I what I would like to see is some, some of the historic districts lighten up a little bit on some of the things like when we want to see your windows. We want to see this. We want to see that. It's like, oh, come on. So if you want to build like in a historic neighborhood, w which I get, you know, like the design, but lighten up a little bit on some of these things. Like they're going a little overboard on some of the um, historic districts. I'd like to see something in between historic and, you know, regular district, like something like, you know, if, they, if the residents in a district really care about what's going in, like something that's not as crazy as historic, but like more like design guidelines, but they're not going to get into like exactly what your windows are going to be, you know, how thick is the frame and is it wood? And, you know, some of them are crazy. I do a lot of jobs in historic districts and it makes it tough. I was going to say you have firsthand experience then how it can be People who oppose historic districts often say they keep development out. They keep it. They keep Denver from being able to build that density that we need. So, do you you see that you could you could see a balance? Is what it sounds like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do. I think um, we could be doing a little bit better job with yeah you know, lightening up on those historic designations. Yeah. Um, something else, obviously, with housing is affordability. And a lot of people say that rent control or rent stabilization would be um, something that could help Denver. Some folks say it would be more red tape. It would put pressure on landlords. Um, there's a proposal in front of state lawmakers right now to lift the statewide ban on rent control. As a as mayor of Denver, how do you feel? Would you implement rent control? I'm from New Jersey. I think they invented it out there, like New York City. It's been, you know, my first experience of learning about rent control was a guy I used to work on Wall Street. And some guy, you know, one of my friends came to me and said, hey, you want this? You want to live in this apartment? Because I'm moving and it's $100 a month. And I'm like, how is it so cheap? And he's like, well, it's rent controlled, you know? And I'm like, okay. And I have some friends out in California and San Francisco you know, same thing. There's a lot of games going on with rent control. I do think it adds a lot of bureaucracy on top of it and it wastes a lot of money. 
but we've been doing, you know, rent control is a policy that gets implemented when you haven't been doing affordable housing for 15 years which is what's been going on. So now we have to look at something called rent control. I would have rather naturally of, you know, taking care of the problem before it exists. Um, but just simply nobody was really listening. Um, we didn't allow ADUs to be built, accessory dwelling units. I just read an article last week about the state maybe imposing that zoning onto Denver, which is saying, well, why don't we have ADUs citywide? Now the city council is backpedaling, trying to get ADUs. It would have been a great place to, uh, a great thing to add density to the city and stem off the affordable housing crisis, but it's just simply too late. They let Airbnbs run wild for six years illegally. They didn't enforce it, took tons of, I mean, there's so many things they did wrong for, and, and so many things I went down there and said, hey, this stuff has to stop. It's affecting our affordable housing. But here we are, we're in a crisis with affordable housing, and now we have rent control in front of us. It's, it's just something I would rather we did it right, like, you know, saw the signs 10 years ago and said, hey, we should not allow these AD or uh, Airbnbs to be on the market illegally. I had some friends had 15 of them, 15. There's one of the candidates that's a product of getting kicked out of his long-term rental because they're converting it to an Airbnb. And this went on for years without the city doing any. I can't think of what's worse, the lack of enforcement on Airbnbs or car theft. You know, it's a, it's a hard toss up, you know? So I want to, I want to just follow up on a couple of things. So you're, you're no rent, you're no on rent control. Well, you know, not in its traditional sense. Okay. I'd like to put a little more thought into it so it's not abused because the only, a lot of experience I've seen with rent control has been abuse of it. And we don't want that happening because sometimes what like this uh, example I was giving you in, it was an apartment in Little Italy and it had been in this guy's family for like 30 something years. It's like, and really nobody was staying there. Mm -hmm. So it's like, well, this is not, this is taking more inventory off the market because they don't want to let it go because once they let it go, it goes to the free market. So it's like the, the current process, I hate to say, you know, just the traditional rent control will not, will not work. Okay. So we need to think of a different word and a different product to put forth. And you, you'd mentioned accessory dwelling units or granny flats, mother-in-law apartments. Um, would you, what, how do you feel about them being all over the city? Like oh, the ability to I'd, do that? I'd love it. Okay. I, I think that would be wonderful. I mean, you know, I was advocating it from the beginning. Like I, I think it was 15 years ago, I was saying this would be a great place because you have, I've built ADUs. Uh, a lot of them are like 500 square feet. They're perfect for like somebody coming out of college, you know, cheap rent, um, somebody to start building their life, you know, and especially when you're saddled with a bunch of debt, you know, or something. So you're looking for something that's inexpensive, but, uh, you know, a good place to live. And it, it would have been a wonderful uh, solution, but I'm a big fan of them. Yes. Okay. So I want to ask you a question from your platform. Um, you have a section on your campaign website dedicated to, dedicated to Xavier Wake, who was a 19-year-old who died on the street, not far from Urban Peak, which is a, a youth shelter. I wonder, wh what is your plan? You, you have this Xavier Wake plan. What do you want to do to make Denver a better place for housing insecure youth like Xavier? Well, I want everyone to have a place to go doesn't matter where you're from, what your problem is, what you're going through. Um, I want entry level housing that the Xavier plan is this 16 by 16 tandem cubicle construction I'm talking about. Um, I, I'm getting a lot of criticism because I want to put it out by the airport. I want to put it out by the airport for many reasons. It will meet no resistance. It, I, you can't put 25 tiny home villages around town and you're going to face so much resistance, it's going to be years before it even gets off the ground. We need to get something started immediately. Uh, so this plan, it's a real blueprint. Um, it, it's going to be topped by 56,000 solar panels, too. This is something that needed to happen years ago. We need cost-effective housing. We need people to give people a starting point. We're not giving them any starting point. So I, I need to do this and I will do this. 
and I'll do it in one year. So I see the point you're making about building these affordable units, particularly for young folks or unhoused folks out by the airport because they wouldn't meet the resistance you're saying of every neighborhood having to approve that, right? The, the pushback that say the the safe outdoor spaces have been getting. But my question is, if you build all, all of the housing out there, there's no services out there. It's like so far from the city. What, there's no, I mean, school, I mean, everything is, is yeah. kind of missing and, and, from that. And this is what I'm getting. But if you focus on the build out of $25,000, do you know how much money is left over for services? brand new services. So the 7,000 units that I'm proposing to build out by the airport are for the homeless. That is the entry level housing. Okay. Nobody will ever fall below that. That is it. That's your safety net. It can be done. And, and, and then look at all the, I want to do it with municipal bonding. Okay. So $10 million to pay the interest on the municipal bonding per year on 7,000 units, 15 million a year, did I say 10,000? I meant to say 10 million. <laughs> um, 15 million a year for the infrastructure. Okay, that's 25 million a year. Uh, I'm hearing 250 million to 330 million we're spending right now. Do the math. How much is left over for services? My God, tons of money. Uh, right now, what we're doing is, God, it's probably over, like if we remodel these hotels and stuff, you know, it's so expensive to convert a hotel. It all sounds really good, like, or this jail that some people are talking about. Like, has anybody ever remodeled or repurposed a building? Obviously not, because it is wickedly expensive. So when you do the build out so cost effectively, look at all the money that's left over. So I'm looking at over $200 million every year for services. So you so, would kind of build everything folks need around the housing that you've built out by the airport because it is it didn't cost you that much to build the housing in the first place. Yeah, and the city owns like 17,000 acres out there right now. So it's like the land's there, okay? Um, we have, you know, a couple hundred million dollars for services. We can build the actual services brand new specifically for that. We don't have to repurpose buildings. We don't have to, I'm, I'm sick of wasting money. You know, so we can, if we do the housing right, there's tons of money left over for the services. Would you close our shelters if you did that? Well, n it, it depends on how it goes. You know, like, I think we're going to get a, a huge wave of homeless. I mean, some of these leases are expiring in these hotels and they're just going to unleash them onto the streets. Mm -hmm. So, and I, I'm hearing all different kinds of numbers. Like we have 5,000, we have 10,000, we, have, you know, so I don't know what the real numbers are. But I can tell you what, they're scattered all about. I mean, they're everywhere. So no, uh, unless like it's so successful that the, the shelters are like, we don't have anybody in these shelters. I'm like, that would be, that would be wonderful. That would be amazing if yeah. that happened. So, you know. Um, so we have a couple of questions we pick from that we ask every candidate. Um, we've had the same mayor, Michael Hancock, for 12 years. And while many people are ready for a change, many others reelected him twice. Um, what is something you think Mayor Hancock got really right? And what's something you thought you think Mayor Hancock got really wrong? <laughs> Can we start with wrong? <laughs> sure. But you have to have a right as well. Uh, right. OK. <laughs> well, you know, I think people just lost faith in him. You know, the sex scandal, the telling people to stay home from coat. I mean, that was the last straw for me when telling people to stay home from and then, and then spot he got him at the airport. Yeah. My God, it's like, that's it. That did it for me. I was like, that, you know, you're done in my mind. Never return my phone calls. Never. I even went down there in person demanding in air, uh, just in August saying, I need to talk to him. I've tried six times. And um, being out of touch with the people, you know, seeing what we need, you know, building permits taking 12, 14 months. That used to take one day. You know, it's really affecting affordable housing also. I mean, it's a huge problem or, or a business trying to repurpose, do a change of use on a building, start a business here. They don't want to start a business here. They'll wait on the permit for a year. And they're like, I don't have enough money to do that. So, he, he's been out of touch completely, and I don't know what his deal is, but I don't like anything I've really seen. A good thing. Uh, <laughs> boy, there must be something. Uh, hmm. 
I don't know. I'm sorry. I, okay. I can't think of anything. That's fair. That's you know, fair. Uh, he's a good looking guy. <laughs> you know, he dresses well. Um, how's okay. that? Sure. Okay. Sure. Okay. Uh, this is a fun one. Uh, one thing Denver is famous for is what my producer Paul calls Denver style mission style burritos. Chipotle was founded here. So was Qdoba. Illegal Pete's is a local favorite. Yeah. Which one's your favorite? Oh, I, I, you know, I started to go to the Illegal Pete's in Sunnyside, the new one. Um, I, I'd say Chipotle because I'm from the Highlands. I think that was their second or third location there on 32nd and Lowell. You're a Chipotle He's, guy. I know yeah, which one, right? Yeah, one you're I'd talking say, about. I'd say Chipotle just because there's more of them, you know, but <laughs> okay. Illegal Pete's is up there too. You okay. Know? Okay. And, and uh, Santiago's has the best breakfast burritos, you know. I will yeah. 100% agree with you on yeah. that. Um, okay, part of the reason we're inviting all 17 candidates for interviews is because we really want to hear a fresh vision for the future of Denver. What is your vision for Denver? My vision for Denver is that nobody goes unhoused. You know, we have um, vacant cubicles for people. You know, um, migrants come in and we go, well, maybe they could stay here for a little while or, or maybe forever because I have a thousand vacant cubicles right now because the cubicles are meant for people to start there and move on, you know, not get too, you know, they're 16 by 16. So not get too comfortable there where you're going to go, oh, I'll spend the rest of my life here. Like it's designed to be able, you know, you want to move on. So people starting in these cubicles and then moving on. And, uh, you know, having vacant housing would be the most wonderful thing ever. Um, that would be a success. Um, and if we had so much housing, we had enough. Yeah, yeah. More than enough. Yeah. And I, I, I believe the city should be its own developer, you know, should build the affordable housing. Like, forget about these developers and builders. A lot of them moved on, by the way. And yeah, you're one of you're a develop you're a, you're a contractor. I, I should say it's yeah. different, but you you think that the city should take this on? Yeah, I yeah, absolutely, because that's how you do it. Like, I have a plan to build condos for two hundred thousand dollars. You know, it, it easily be done two hundred to three hundred twenty five thousand dollars. So we can cut out all the middlemen, all the profit taking, all the plus people don't like developers. They think they're greedy and they take they take enormous risk. I'll I'll tell you what, I know a lot of them that really lost it, you know, uh in two thousand eight. Mm -hmm. So and we forget about that, you know, but they take enormous risk. Even the developers for the Park Hill golf course, I'm like, really? Do you guys really want to get into a development that big in a declining real estate market? And you see it like it's declined, I think, 16% this month over last year, right now. Do you I have a, can I ask, do you have a take on the, uh, on the Park Hill golf course? I don't, saga? because I don't know what kind of shenanigans went on. Okay. I, I really don't. I, I mean, like, a lot of stuff, I think, went on, and I have no idea. I, I want to see it developed, and I like the idea of a park being there. I think there's a lot of too much focus on this Park Hill golf course anyway, but... Um, it can't remain a, a, just a vacant golf course for 10 years. That's just, that's a failure. And if that happens, yeah, geez, that's, that's, that would be horrible. So yeah, we'll see. Where can people learn more about you and your campaign? I think the best place to learn about me is on Twitter right now. Okay. I'm very active <laughs> on Twitter. I just, you know, found Twitter. Well, I knew about Twitter, but I got on it about a month ago. What's your Twitter handle? Do you know or how can I find you? I don't even know. Robert Tretta, <laughs> Denver Mayor maybe or okay. something like that. Do you have a you have a website as well, right? Yes. I think that's Robert Tretta for Denver Mayor maybe. Okay. You know. Cuz I'm thinking someone might be hearing you for the first time and yeah. is interested to know more about yeah, you. Yeah, or you can just google my name. I think I come up on all, you know, some interviews and so forth. So it's easy to find me because my name is unique. It's not like, you know, Andy Smith or <laughs> no offense to the Andy Smiths of the world, but it's hard to be found when your name is Andy Smith. <laughs> well, Robert Tretta, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Appreciate it. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Mayoral Madness. What we hope is a 17 part interview series with all the candidates on the ballot to be Denver's next mayor. 
We're planning to publish these interviews each week leading up to Election Day on April 4th, and we'll be providing more news and analysis during the week. Subscribe to CityCast Denver and learn more about Mayoral Madness at denver.citycast.fm. We'll be back soon with even more mayoral candidates who want to lead the city.